All right. Well, good morning once again, everyone. Let me move this. We good? Can you hear me? Well, I am really grateful that I get the chance to, uh, to preach to you once again. I feel like I've been doing this a lot lately. You know, you, you're seeing a lot of this face, and that I'm getting really sick of my hair now. It keeps, like, falling in my eyes. It's driving me a little crazy. And, and there's something about the doing this that just feels a little immature. <laughs> Anyways, on that note, uh, you know, for the last couple of weeks— in preparation for this sermon, I was 100% confident that I was going to be preaching on fear this morning. You know, and as, as I was preparing this week, and I was listening to some great lessons, and reading some awesome things, and digging through the scriptures and stuff, as the week kind of rolled on, I was like, well, maybe, maybe fear isn't the topic that God seems to be putting on my heart. And then I was like, well, let's read Psalm 73. is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Maybe we'll study that out together. But then something started to creep up in the back of my mind. This word, forgiveness. And I decided, I was like, you know, I feel stuck. You know, I, I want to I ask. So I reached out to our family group leader men for some wisdom and said, hey, these are the options we got. What do you guys think? And one by one, I started seeing forgiveness kind of coming back as a response. And each time I saw that, I was like, no, I don't think I want to preach on this anymore. And the more that I've been praying about it throughout this week and, and thinking about it and, and studying it, the more I realize, okay, this is exactly what I think God wants us to talk about here this morning. Because forgiveness is a game changer in every element of our lives. And I love what Colby shared. I'm going to say some more about that in just a little bit. But you know, Mother's Day just passed, right? One month ago. Next week is Father's Day, right around the corner. Two holidays that commemorate two of the most significant people in our lives, right? And yet, the two relationships that usually have the biggest need for forgiveness in our lives too. You know, if you're married, you better learn forgiveness. If you have roommates, you better learn forgiveness. If you have friends, neighbors, coworkers, if you have strangers in line in front of you, you better learn forgiveness. You know, people throughout history and across different types of cultures and areas of life have understood its significance. Robert Frost, the poet, said, Forgive me my nonsense, as I also forgive the nonsense of those that think they talk sense. <laughs> you see the spiritual application there? Yeah, you do a great job. Uh, wrongfully attributed to Shakespeare, to err is human, to forgive is divine. And somebody I'm sure you're probably familiar with, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Then another really powerful one. We must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power of love. These men are hinting at something. You know, in the, in the world of psychology, there's actually a, a form of study, a, a practice called, behavior, or, um, called forgiveness therapy. Psychologists are figuring out that forgiving ourselves and forgiving other people is essential to who we are as humans and a part of a healing process. They're starting to tie this to addictions, to anger, to heart disease, to depression, and a number of other psychoses, sees, psychoses. These things are tied directly to a lack of forgiveness. One site I read actually made mention that, that this doesn't have, that, that forgiveness doesn't actually have any, doesn't need to have anything to do with religion because they are learning how necessary it is to the health of who we are as human beings. 
Mayo Clinic, Stanford Med, all have articles about the importance and the significance of forgiveness. And guess what? They're figuring out something that we don't really need to be told because God has been saying it for thousands of years. We must grasp this all-important concept in the Bible. Our ability to understand the love of God and to show the love of God to others hinges on forgiveness. Matter of fact, look at what Jesus says in Matthew 6. It says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. 1 John 4 is a powerful chapter where it talks about, it talks about love. How can we love God who we can't see unless we love our, our brother who we can see? And these two scriptures kind of run in parallel with each other. And really what it, what it says is that, is that our love for God is symbiotic to our love for one another. So our love and forgiveness with God is tied to our forgiveness with one another. We can't separate them. And I don't know how you feel. Like, I mean, like the topic of forgiveness, like all of us probably understand we, we should. Right? It's a good idea. And then Jesus says, no, if you don't, God won't. Today, the title of our sermon is The Freedom of Forgiveness. I want us to go ahead and say a prayer together as we get into the scriptures. Father, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for your infinite wisdom and patience with us. Uh, that that, that this, this all-important topic, this all-important quality of, of love, something that is so elusive, so challenging, so difficult, so personal, Father. But yet, God, so significant to understand in our relationship with you as well in, as in our relationships with each other. And I pray that you will open the eyes of our heart, that you will help us to be humble to your scriptures. That, Holy Spirit, you will speak through me to share only what you want said here this morning. But God, I pray that we will wrap our minds and hearts, that our lives will, will be centered around forgiveness, our forgiveness in you and then our forgiveness with each other. We love you, God, and your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to start, as you guessed it, in, a, in vocab land, I need to come up with like a clever way to say this or something, like, like what, like vocab corner or something like that, because you know that I'm going to talk about some kind of Greek or Hebrew word if I get up here. Uh, afiami, the word for forgiveness, afiami, 162 references in the New Testament. The literal definition of this word is to release. The others are, the others where it shows up in translation are to forgive, to pardon, to remit, to cancel, to leave, to abandon, to allow, to permit, and to tolerate. You know, most references, when you look it up in the New Testament, most references where this word shows up, talk about leaving something. So Matthew 4, after tempting Jesus, and the devil realized he couldn't get it done, it says he afiami Jesus. He left him. The disciples, when Jesus called them to the mission of discipleship, the mission of, of making disciples of all nations, they pulled their boats and their nets up on shore, and they afiami right there on the shore. And I love even that, that, that picture, that mental picture. That's kind of what, when we even think about forgiveness, this is a great mental picture to have in mind, is the disciples taking their nets and dropping them, leaving them behind to go and be with Jesus. Colby brought it up, but in Jesus teaching the Lord's Prayer, teaching his disciples how to pray, he said, God, forgive us our debts as we forgive the debts of others. Another way we could translate this is, God, help us to leave and release our debts before you as we relieve and leave the debts of others. To lay them down, leave them behind. And I want you to take a second to imagine a world without forgiveness. Yeah, terrifying, isn't it? Okay, I'm going to show you a story. So this is, 
there's a story, this is a real story, called the Spite House. Okay? In the 1950s in Virginia City, Nevada, there were two miners that disliked each other very, very much. The first miner brought in a lot, bought a lot in the downtown area of the city and built this beautiful, lovely white house. Unfortunately for him, the second miner bought the lot right beside him. And he, <laughs> and he had his previously built red house relocated right beside him. So close, it's a mere inches away from the first miner's house. So it meant the White House no longer enjoyed the same sunlight, no gentle breezes, just the cold, sterile, red brick house view of your worst enemy. This is a great picture to me of a world without forgiveness. And the reality is, even as Colby brought it up earlier, is that a lot of us are living like this. In this, in this pettiness, grudge holding, the unwilling to let go until we become, we, we become embonded to each other in the worst ways possible. Lowering each other's property values. We'll say that. I want to go back to the scripture that Colby read in Matthew 18. I was, actually, we're going to be right before it. Sorry. In verse 15, Jesus says, If your brother or sister sins, go, point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Okay, Jake, why are we reading this passage? This is about forgiveness. Well, here, Jesus gives us instructions of what we are supposed to do if someone sins against us, right? Now, corporations today, corporate America, have literally just copied and pasted this in their conflict resolution manuals. There's so much wisdom to how we go about this, all right? But what does, what does this passage, what is Jesus teaching us about this tell us? Well, guess what? People are going to hurt you. They're going to hurt you a lot. You're going to get hurt by many people. And even in the church. If you notice, he says, if your brother or sister, the spiritual people in your life, where we're supposed to feel safe and this is God's house and we're about love and we're about doing things righteously and honoring, guess what? It's still going to happen. And it's going to happen a lot. So much so that Jesus said, I got to teach you guys how to deal with this so you don't kill each other. Building brick houses next to each other and whatnot. So right after this teaching is the story that Colby read for communion. I want us to pick back up at that. I'm going to read it again, verse 21. This parable, this story is too good to, to pass up. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to settle, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. When the servant went out, he found, out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. 
but he refused. Instead, he went off he, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Deja vu. Right? God, God knew we, just, we needed to hear this passage a lot today. And I think Colby did a fantastic job demonstrating our personal need for forgiveness in this passage. Right? That we, we have a debt that is beyond our ability to pay, that has been forgiven. And it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 30 years, for two years, if you're not a Christian yet, all of us have a debt that we are unable to pay still. You're still racking up debt. But we're going to continue the discussion here for the other side of this parable and look more in depth at how this needs to show up in our relationships with one another. You know, it says, Peter, after Jesus got done doing his teaching, you know, at the beginning of this, uh, of this chapter, in chapter 18, the disciples are arguing over who's the greatest. And they go to Jesus and say, Jesus, tell us who's the greatest in the kingdom. And he goes and he tells them about children. He invites the children to come up. You know, the story, you know, let the little children come to me. The greatest, you got to become like one of these. He talks about how valuable kids are, that God loves them. We need to protect them. And then he transitioned into this, into this conflict resolution thing that we just read. And then Peter jumps in. Kind of high and mighty. I think he was riding right off the heels of who's the greatest in the kingdom. He's like, well, I'm going to show these disciples what's up. Lord, 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 got a question for you. So I know the, uh, the tradition, the Old Testament says forgive three times. What if I forgive seven? Ooh. And Jesus comes back and he's like, yeah, Seven? What about 77 times? Now that number, the numbers are irrelevant. It's not literally keep a tally of 77. The number, the number for seven in the Bible is perfection. It's, it's wholeness, completeness. So he said, no, you keep on forgiving. You forgive and you forgive and you forgive and you forgive and you don't stop. Now it's interesting to me that Peter begins this discussion on forgiveness right on the heels of Jesus talking about conflict resolution and how we're supposed to spawn, respond when someone sins against you. I think there's something Peter's trying to get at for us. For all of his self-righteousness and his arrogance in this moment, I think he just made a connection to something. Just because sin is dealt with or hurt is brought to the light doesn't mean it's been forgiven. Then Jesus tells the parable. Like, okay, I hear you, Jesus. I hear that we're, that we're supposed to, you know, if somebody hurts us, we talk about it and stuff. Well, let's talk about forgiveness now. And Jesus is like, okay, let's talk about forgiveness. And like I said, I love what Colby shared about debts in the parable. And in this, this man, right, that, that gets this, this unbelievable debt forgiven, that's all of us, quickly turns around and throws this other man in prison for a substantially less amount. Now, from a psychology perspective, there's actually something really cool about this. Psychology talks a lot about forgiveness in the terms of prison. When someone hurts us, we put them in prison, in our minds, in our hearts. We create a separation, a cell of punishment, so that they can't hurt us again. So that we can protect ourselves from being offended once more. And then we try to, and we don't talk about it, really. We just try to move on, stuff it away, and then leave them in that cell while we create a dialogue in our head about how evil they are. Who they are and what they've done to hurt us. And over time, it tends to get exponentially worse, the offense. 
And we don't want to forgive them until they feel the pain that we feel. Until they suffer some kind of penance or they earn our forgiveness back. The problem with this is a few things. First of all, it completely flies in the face of what Jesus just talked about. God has forgiven you beyond your ability to be forgiven. The other side of this is that unforgiveness imprisons others without acknowledging the prison that we deserve. You deserve this while me over here, I'm innocent. And Jesus is trying to rebuke that part of our hearts. The part of us that says, well, they don't deserve forgiveness. And Jesus says, well, yeah, neither do you. But God loves you enough that he gives it to you anyways. Well, well, Jesus, they hurt me. You put me on a cross. And did you hear what I happened to say when I was up there? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But the second problem with unforgiveness is that it ignores who the true enemy is. The Bible tries to remind us the battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not, you're not my enemy. I'm not yours. It's not my wife. It's not, it's not anybody in my life that I feel hurt by. They are not the enemy. The battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers and authorities in this dark world. But the last problem with unforgiveness is that in trying to put the people who hurt us into prison, really we're putting ourselves into this prison. We create isolation. We let Satan feed us bitterness. And we hurt our relationships that have nothing to do with the person who actually hurt us because of that person that we won't forgive. They're not in prison. We are. Nelson Mandela has an amazing quote. This as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I would still be in prison. He understood this concept. And, this, and when you think about his life, when you think about what he suffered, it, he didn't deserve that. But he knew if I, don't, if I hang on to a lack of forgiveness, it is going to keep me shackled for the rest of my life. I am still going to be sitting in that cell. There's a powerful truth here. Because on the other side of this, just as unforgiveness creates prison, forgiveness is the only way to freedom. It's the most freeing thing we can ever do. But I want to clarify what it is and what it isn't for a second. Forgiveness is not being steamrolled or being a doormat. Part of why in, earlier on in chapter 18, Jesus said, if somebody hurts you, this is how you're supposed to address it. He doesn't say just let them do it. So look, if somebody hurts you, go and deal with it. Matter of fact, you can bring somebody else involved. They're not going to listen. So forgiveness does not mean being steamrolled. It doesn't mean forgetting. That's a mistake. We often take it like, well, forgive and forget. Well, really only God does that. That's not at the core of what forgiveness is. It isn't being quiet about hurts. And it isn't, and this is maybe one of the harder parts of this, it isn't something that they have to accept or understand. It is choosing to release someone from the guilt or debt that you hold over them and wipe the slate clean. Forgiveness is doing this, and here's, here's one that's really difficult to swallow too. Forgiveness is doing this 
whether they have earned it or not, whether they have apologized or not, made amends or not, have changed or not, or whether they are alive or not. To be able to accept it. Some of us, I know, are through all kinds of history and personal things, you're still holding on to a grudge, to a pain, to a lack of forgiveness with somebody that's already gone. Waiting for words that will never come. And allowing yourself to be stuck in prison because of it. What forgiveness is, is a choice. It's not a feeling. And it requires an enormous amount of self-denial. I want to show you guys a video that you probably have seen. It's the brother of, uh, of the young man that was, that was shot and killed in his own apartment. This is the trial of the, of the off-duty police officer that shot him. Just like my brother did, but I see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I don't know if this is possible, but can can I give her a hug, please? Please. Yes. It's hard to know even what to say after that. The courage and the self-denial that that took to choose to let go of that debt to this woman, to embrace her in love, to share, I just want the best for you. It didn't show the part that before that he said, he said, I want you to know that I forgive you. Despite what my family feels, and his family had already shared a lot of things with her, he said, I forgive you. And as I was sharing earlier, part of why this became clear that I felt like God needed, a, needed me to preach on this is that God was confronting me on this. I didn't realize in myself, that I had been holding someone in my life hostage. And I had lost sleep. I was having stomach pains. I was dealing with all kinds of anxiety responses, and I wasn't sure where it was coming from. And plenty of other stuff. I'm not going to share who it was or what happened or anything like that. That's not really important. But I spent some time in prayer, and I was really struggling with this. I was even asking myself, what am I waiting for? What am I hoping to hear? What am I hoping that will happen that will, that will allow me to be in a place that I can forgive? And as I was praying, I was reminded I was at a marriage retreat years ago that Al and Gloria Baird led together. And the first lesson was all about forgiveness. And they shared something that I'll probably, I'll probably never forget. Is they were sharing about the, 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 really the kind of the two layers of what forgiveness really is at its core. That there's, there's the I forgive you for the offense. I forgive you for what you did. I forgive you for what you said. I forgive you for the direct hurt that you caused me. But there's another layer to forgiveness. That is, that is where God is. 
and his forgiveness of us that we have to fight with. That is the most difficult part of this. I can acknowledge the hurt. But the second part of this is that forgiveness is not, I forgive you for what you did. It's I forgive you for you. I forgive you, the sinner. I forgive you, the person that is broken. I forgive you in who you are, past, present, and future. That's God's forgiveness of us. Like I said, I can acknowledge the man, you hurt me in this. But the no, the, the, the part of me that fears that you're going to hurt me again, that part I can't forgive. And that's the part that I was holding on to. And as I was praying, I just, I found myself feeling angry. Because I didn't want to. And I knew it was a matter of me choosing. I didn't need any, I didn't need to hear anything. I had to decide whether or not I was going to forgive. And yesterday I made that phone call. And I'm going to tell you, I got off the phone. I felt shaky. Very heavy. And you know what? The hurt's not gone. I'm not done feeling hurt. But I let go of the debt. And I'm not saying this because I don't want to share this with you because you think that I'm I figured something out with this. I haven't. Because I'm going to need to do it again. And again, and again, and again. Thank you. We're going to wrap up here in just a minute, or just a second here. I want to show you a scripture in Luke 17. In Luke 17, verse 4. Jesus instructed his disciples to forgive. He said, even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostles' response to this was, Lord, increase our faith. Forgiveness takes faith. It takes courage. But so many of us are holding on to feelings Grudges and attitudes. Maybe people here in this room where church is painful for you. Maybe it's your spouse, it's your parents, it's your neighbor, whoever. I don't care. It's time to break these chains. This bitterness and experience the freedom that forgiveness offers. As we close here, I've got a, we call it Living Water Challenge. Saw this last week, Marcus did this, and I was like, I need to do this in our sermons. Two questions for us to wrestle with this week. What forgiveness do you need to seek from God? What are the areas, what is, what is the debt, the, the, those bags of gold that Colby was talking about that we need to go and acknowledge before God? Then maybe the harder one for us to wrestle with is what forgiveness do you need to offer to someone else? You know who it is. You know what it is. If we're not willing to embrace the freedom that God is offering in this, then we're going to live our lives in prison. The Bible reminds us over and over and over again throughout the New Testament, it's for, it's for freedom that we have been set free. God wants us to live without chains, but we embrace these chains over and over again when we hold on to a lack of forgiveness. And we're going to wrap up our service here. Oh.